Hi there and welcome again to the uh, Explaining History podcast. Um, I'm going to look tonight uh, once again at Tombstone by Yang Jisheng, um, which is a, a, a personal uh, history of um, Mao's Great Famine during the, the Great Leap Forward um, uh, from uh, 1958 to 62. Um, the the single uh, most devastating famine in recorded human history um, that killed anywhere between uh, the the author Yang Jisheng puts it at thirty six million uh, Frank Dakota puts it at a, uh, at least at the very least forty million and some estimates put it as high as seventy million some go up at, at as high as one hundred and twenty million but. I my my personal sense is that it is somewhere between the forty to seventy million range. Um, the, the 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 accolades that Yang Zhisheng has had actually this is this is a very important writer um, to to look at. If uh, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, I did um, a, a podcast about conditions on freedom um, on freedoms. During the post Mao era, which are um, were relatively improved during Deng Xiaoping's early years, and um, currently uh, under Xi Jinping uh, are taking a, a, a nosedive. Um, so Yang Zhisheng to be uh, publishing this book. Um, this was 2014, I believe, but to be writing as a dissident writer. Um, currently is uh, pretty bold stuff um, on some of the reviews on the back Anne Applebaum of whom I've mentioned before who wrote an excellent book on the Soviet gulags refers to him uh, as uh, China's Solzhenitsyn which I, I think is a, a, a fair a fair comment um, and the point is that it's the first Mass published Chinese account of uh, by somebody who actually lived through the famine. So, um, without further ado, let's look at uh, a key point that he raises. One of the reasons, one of the reasons why you get famines um, and famines on the scale that that we have seen in the twentieth century, is that it's very often a meeting of. Um, you know, unfortunate, um, uh, unfortunate environmental conditions which produce things like droughts and food shortages. But these morph into famines when um, the state and ideology um, are put into are put into play. The the needs of the state were such that um, shortages. Have, and this is one of the men, one of the the many aspects of the uh, um, state behaviour that contributes to the famine. The shortages had to be ignored or had to be refuted. Um, the idea that the Great Leap Forward, which was designed to create uh, economic transition uh, and also material abundance, was actually resulting in uh, in hunger. Um, had to be denied um, strenuously. So let's look uh, at, at uh, Tombstone. So um, in the chapter, uh, the epicenter of the disaster, um, Yang Zhisheng writes a section called The Violent Campaign Against False Reporting Output. He writes, Excessively high re- requisition quotas made procurement difficult. If farmers were unable to hand over the required amount, the government would accuse production teams of concealing grain. By this time, the um, farms had been collectivised, but also uh, entire regions had been communalised. That meant that villages had been um, forced to together, um, village kitchens had been stripped out, uh, or kitchens had been stripped out of houses, um, peasants had been forced to eat communally, which was a great way of controlling the grain um, for the entire village. 
the whole point, of course, was to extract as much grain from the, um, the from, from the countryside and either sell it as um, export cash crops, so selling rice overseas to gain gain um, foreign credits to um, buy in, and import machinery, or to feed workers in the cities and to uh, set up the the peasants as the kind of if they didn't uh, comply with this as the kind of the scapegoat the counter revolutionary scapegoats that were causing all the trouble and ruining it for everybody. Um, the just like uh, Stalin's collectivization and his war against the kulaks, Mao followed the playbook, note for note, and made sure that there was a uh, a violent campaign in the countryside of extraction. Um, a struggle between the two roads of socialism and capitalism was launched to counteract the alleged withholding of grain. The campaign used political pressure, mental torture and ruthless violence to extort every last kernel of grain or seed from the peasants. Anyone who uttered the slightest protest was beaten, sometimes fatally. A meeting at Rooster Mountain pushed the campaign against grain hoarding to a climax. Li Roy Ying, the wife of Zhang Shufan, was chair of Xinjiang's pre Jinyang Prefecture's Federation of Women. In June 1959, the Prefectural Party Committee had her lead a work group to Rooster Mountain Commune to report on a pilot project to produce 5,000 kilos of paddy per mu of land. Mu is a, a something equivalent to, uh, to a hectare. The brainchild of the county party secretary, Li Wei Yang's um, team stayed at Rooster Mountain for a month, during which they learned that this model commune was a fraud and that the peasants were starving. So here, here we have the kind of the, the Maoist equivalent of the Potemkin village. The, um, the thing that appears to be harmonious and um, uh, productive and functional on the outside um, but in the reality is that all this, this mass productivity um, is simply just plunder. The peasants aren't producing surpluses of grain, the state is just taking not just the regular surplus but also anything, the subsistence, anything that the farmers uh, have to live on. So being, being as farming uh, since the very beginnings of agriculture is all about the, the kind of the art of creating food surpluses, this is a, a sort of like a war on the concept of farming uh, I itself. Um, so starving peasants were soon um, discovered by some members of the party who, who really were, uh, you know, had, had consciences and were concerned and, and shocked by what they uncovered. Li Wuyang um, wrote to the prefectural party secretary, Liu Jianwen, requesting 105,000 kilos of grain, but Liu refused and labelled Li, Li Wuyang um, a right deviationist. A cadre sent to Rooster Mountain to replace, replace Lee also truthfully reported the hunger of commune members, only, only to be labelled a vacillator. There was a great deal of fear and anxiety involved in accepting the truth about the, the situation. Anyone who agreed to um, kilos of 105,000 kilos of grain being sent to a region had to um, tacitly accept that there was hunger there. To tacitly accept that there was hunger there was to accept that Mao's um, key policy uh, not only had failed, but was turning into a catastrophe. Mao himself had toured China um, during the Great Leap Forward and had been, uh, obviously his tour had been stage managed to prevent even him from seeing the consequences of the Great Leap Forward. Um, and he would probably have chosen to ignore it himself anyway, had he seen. Li's replacement, Wang Binglin, tried to appease party secretary Liu Jianwen by organising an on-the-spot meeting to oppose false reporting of output and private withholding. 
the arcane official formulation for hoarding. All that was produced uh, were rice husks covered by a thin layer of grain. The prefectural party committee ordered local cadres to stifle the public outcry, stop villagers from fleeing in search of food, and halt the closure of communal kitchens. So villagers um, very soon, uh, under the, the conditions of the famine, began to... Um, try to take it as what, what action they could do to survive. The, the causes of the famine are, are as follows. Firstly, there had been um, a, a totally misguided policy, uh, the product of um, uh, Soviet um, agronomists, particularly a, a guy called Trofim Lysenko, who's a, a well-known fraud in scientific uh, terms of talked about Lysenko before, um, who uh, advised the all too eager to listen Maoists um, that uh, productivity could be increased by planting um, rice plants in rice paddies uh, more closely together or uh, by planting them more deeply. Um, and it obviously um, rice farmers over thousands of years had learned exactly how to how to cultivate rice and uh, didn't need a, uh, a know-it-all Soviet agronomist who was also um, a man who willfully distorted the figures to suit his the outcomes that he wanted anyway. So rice harvests failed. There were, were requisitions, there were quotas on, uh, on communes to uh, take uh, huge surpluses um, of rice, leaving villages that were dependent on being able to put food away for um, uh, season, you know, colder seasons and, and um uh, seasons when rice didn't grow um, to to store that for um, for times of death. There were uh, there was a huge removal of peasant workers from the land. Communes um, were set up um, and massive uh, labour armies were uh, diverted to uh, largely uh, pointless engineering projects dams which were built in the wrong place um, that would uh, silt up and then break their, their, um, their walls within a generation. Um, when you take 100,000 people from a province off the land, then you take all the manpower that would normally make food grow. The, there were um, party bosses and cadres who had to beat work norms, they had to um, make sure that the targets they had been set for uh, productivity weren't just reached, but they were breached. And in doing so, they would work some peasants for, you know, 100 hours nonstop without food or sleep. And um, well, normally about two thirds of the way through that, people would simply drop dead. Um, the um, decision by the government to be exporting food during a famine um, showed a kind of a criminal disregard for the the fate of ordinary Chinese people. But Mao had to appear to his um, uh, to to nations that were willing to listen, particularly uh, nations in. Um, just outside the Soviet sphere, the uh, places such as Albania, um, that the Soviet Union, uh, that the that Maoist China, was able to outproduce the Soviet Union. Much of this, Ma Mao said that he wished to um, uh, leapfrog um, um, over Great Britain and, and become. Um, a, a more important economic power than, than Great Britain in the late 1950s, um, which in his wreck, I mean, now that seems sort of slightly absurd to us because Britain is a, a much smaller and diminished power, but obviously it really was still quite an impressive world economic power in the late 1950s. Uh, but it was really the Soviet Union that Mao was kind of talking to. Stalin had passed away. He, the new replacement, uh, Khrushchev, Mao had very little time for and saw him as a, a kind of a political nonentity. He saw 
uh, Khrushchev as being um, a, a kind of a joke, really, uh, and believed himself to be the key figure of world revolution. Part of the point of the Great Leap Forward was to show the Soviet Union, well, you, you had um, the five-year plans under Stalin, but here's how it's really done. Um, we want to uh, do uh, better than you in a shorter amount of time. Uh, and in doing so, we will communicate to the rest of the communist world who's really in charge. So Yang Zhisheng writes... Anyone who claimed to have no grain was labelled as a negator of the three banners, a negator of the great harvest, or a right deviationist, and was subject to struggle. Struggle means to a, a struggle session, and what that normally entailed is if you were in a village, you'd be taken up in front of the, uh, the rest of the villagers and forced to denounce yourself for hours and hours and hours on end, normally with an angry party card just shouting at you and telling you to stop telling lies and to tell even more um, degrading secrets about yourself. And so the, the person would be driven half mad uh, through kind of anxiety and fear. The audience kind of uh, knew how to please the cadre and um, how to respond, uh, and it was normally by whipping itself up into ever greater levels of, of rage towards this traitor in their midst, even though most people knew full well, rationally, the individual hadn't done, uh, hadn't done any wrong. It, Yang Zhisheng writes, if communal kitchens closed due to lack of food, this was labelled the masses threatening the cadres, and abandoning starving children along the roadsides was labelled an assault against the party. Punishments were inflicted on cadres and villages alike. In Guangshan country, uh, County, 2,241 people were beaten, 105 fatally, and 526 cadres were stripped of their official positions. The number of deaths and physical abuse rose even higher towards the end of the campaign. In the Xinjiang incident, Chao Pei Hui describes the situation in one village. At the end of September 1959, Wang Pingui, a member of the Wang Xiaowan production team, was forced to hand over grain kept in his home and was beaten with a shoulder pole, dying of his injuries five days later. Not long after Wang's death, the rest of his four-member household died of starvation. Of course, you take the the last breadwinner out of the situation. There is no safety net for everybody else. It continues. In October 1959, Liu Mingzhu of the Luwan production team, uh, upon failing to hand over any grain, was bound and suspended in mid-air and beaten, then doused with ice-cold water. He died the next day. On October the 13th, 1959, Wang Taishu of the Chen Wan production team, upon failing to hand over any grain, was bound and beaten with shoulder poles and rods, dying four days later. His 14-year-old daughter, Wang Pingrong, subsequently died of starvation. On October the 15th, 1959, Zhang Zhirong of the Zhang Wan production team, upon failing to hand over any grain, was bound and beaten to death by, uh, with kindling and poles. The brigade's cadre used tongs to insert rice and soybeans into the deceased's anus while shouting, Now you can grow grains out of your corpse. Zhang left behind children aged 8 and 10, who subsequently died of starvation. So part of what we see here is a pattern of, of kind of mass um, trauma to society. Uh, the Maoist state had literally uh, smashed peasant China uh, apart um, using uh, requisitioning of food, using requisitioning of manpower, using the destruction of this, the traditional structures of peasant life through communalization and the creation of communal kitchens, uh, which in effect meant that uh, kitchens and cooking utensils would be ripped out of family homes and that the only thing that individuals could do would be, would be to be dependent on being fed 
at a, a, a communal level. Once again, controlling the supply of food. Um, by controlling the supply of food in a country that is ab abundant with food, uh, the new the Maoist government was uh, able to bring the entire population to a, a, a degree of serfdom. And perhaps even even slavery, you could you could call it. Um, Liu Wenkai, secretary of the Guangshan County Party Secretariat, was in charge of and the anti hoarding campaign in Huidan's People's Commune, uh, during which he flogged more than forty peasants, four of whom died. Some ninety three percent of the commune level cadres in Guangshan County led such uh, um, led such campaigns and personally took part in beatings. On November the 28th, 1960, a report was sent to, to Henan Party Secretary Wu Jipu. In the calamity at Guangshan County Huidan's People's Commune in the, the autumn of 1959, the commune's average yield per mu was 86 kilos, for a total of 5.95 uh, for a, uh, and a total of 5.955 million kilos. The Communes Party Committee reported that the yield of 313 kilos per mu for a total of 23.5 23, million kilos. The procurement quota set by the uh, county was 6 million kilos, which exceeded the Communes' total grain yield. In order to achieve the procurement quota, every means had to be taken to oppose false reporting. This idea of false reporting was uh, a, a kind of a fiction in itself. That no, people weren't false reporting. People were uh, unable to produce the amount of food that was uh, demanded, or their, or the peasants did what the peasants had done throughout Chinese history and put some aside so that they didn't starve later on. To oppose false reporting and private withholding, every scrap of food had to be seized from the masses. The final procurement was 5.185 million kilos. All of the communal kitchens were closed down and deaths followed. So uh, private kitchens were closed down, family kitchens were closed down, but also communal kitchens were as well. The, um, uh, the, the, the villages are left with no means of feeding themselves. Liu Wenkai and the Commune Party Committee attributed the kitchen closures and deaths to attacks by well-to-do middle peasants and sabotage by class enemies and to the struggle between the two paths of socialism and capitalism. This was a really interesting kind of fiction uh, in that Party Card just said, well, look, you know, this, this is, this, we're, we're fighting a, a war to the death with capitalism here. This is messy. And part of what they meant was hoarding was capitalism. That um, hiding grain so you can feed yourself tomorrow was capitalism because they said, well, that's a kind of speculation, isn't it? And you're probably speculating that um, if you hoard your grain now, then the prices of price of grain will go up next week and you'll make a profit, making you a, a capitalist blood-sucking blood exploiter, right deviationist, running dog, etc. So this was this was the mentality. And the way that I think is is useful to, to think about it um, is that the, the Great Leap Forward is a, is a kind of, uh, and, and the famine that results from it, is it's a kind of like social warfare, really. It is the, uh, a, a war against, mainly against China's peasants, uh, they weren't the only people to starve, but mainly it was China's peasants. Um, and because and because they uh, had the, the foodstuffs that Mao believed would power China into this new age of industrial abundance, they had to be uh, expropriated. Uh, Mao didn't really care how much bloodshed that resulted in. Okay, so that's um, the to this week's podcast. Um, if you remember, check us out at www.explaininghistory.org. Um, and there's always something new and interesting going up there each week. Normally, um, this podcast or a bit of uh, writing that I do or, or what have you. 
Um, and come and visit us at the Explaining History Facebook group where there's uh, interesting articles and bits and pieces that I, I managed to procure uh, go up there too. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, and thanks to all the people that sponsor the podcast via Patreon. We're always grateful, uh, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.